Well, that's the deeper question. Because in the in the grand scheme of things, who's going to remember anything? So they remember I'm this, as long as they remember you. Say hello to Mr. Dave Huck. Hey, folks. You're watching uh, The Amazing Vito Show. Uh, I'm talking to my buddy, uh, Bill Davern, who is a... Uh, He's a comedian, uh, and also he's also uh, done plenty of movies, um, short movies, documentaries. Yeah, yeah, but it, like you've been at it for quite a while, so you know a lot about the business. And there's stuff that when I talk to you about it, you're you're like, it's one of those things. When I talk to you, you always it's always like, man, if I knew that you know, I wouldn't have made these mistakes and, you know, I wouldn't have, have, have strangled that guy. So uh, talk about let's talk about what you've, 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 you've been, uh, you yes. made a real cool documentary uh, about a, a friend of ours that passed away uh, years ago, yeah. uh, Dave Hook, and he made, a, I'll, I'll play a little bit of it. Anything I can do that won't fuck things up? No. <laughs> I was recording that, so. <laughs> Go ahead. I want to start with you right from the beginning. And if I had a million dollars, that was a big, big landlord. And if I had a million dollars, that raise your rent to something you couldn't afford. If I had a million dollars, I'd buy you an exotic pet like a python that could kill you and some of the uh, material that you do is uh, off color off color remember re remember this is a noon show <laughs> i would say that i'm a dirty comedian okay but you know that's how do you define dirty dirty would be profanity talking about those subjects that they don't talk about on tv i understand what dave dave was taken away way too early at a young age uh, he had, you know, uh, uh, a brain tumor and it, it got, it, it got to, it, you know, he succumbed to it. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, I, you know, I understand if you're an older person, uh, but he was young. So, um, when making something like that, did you feel like, Am I taking advantage of this person? Because in a couple of months, he's going to be gone. Or do you feel like I'm going to show everybody this is how great he was? Because uh, that's how I would take it. Yeah, exactly the latter. I wanted to make, actually, it was more probably Dave's idea anyway, if I remember. That was 2005. And I just wanted to sit him down and keep his spirit alive. And... Uh, yeah, 2005, he knew he was going to pass away. Uh, and as you and I uh, will give a little bit of a background to Dave, Dave was one of the great comics, a road warrior comic that we knew uh, for years, fantastic um, uh, guitar parodies and all that, you know, which I, of course, included some of those clips. And uh, we had the pleasure of uh, both you and I of performing with him several times. He never got the big break in the comedy world that he was seeking. Um, but initially he was a boxer, like you were heavy into boxing as well, weren't you, Vito? Yeah, that's how me and Dave, one day, I didn't even know he was, uh, I met him at uh, a party you were throwing. And- uh, You met was, him at my party? Yeah. Oh my God, isn't that funny? Because oh. you know what, the very same room that I conducted that interview is here. You know, yeah. like, yeah. so you were here and that's where you met him. I did not know that. Yeah. But like, oh, okay. um, but, um, yeah, we for some reason you heard me talking about, there was a fight coming up and I was talking to another guy about it and, uh, he, he chimed in on it and, uh, he, he you know, he, he was a former, uh, boxer himself. Yeah. Being in the center of a ring, the center of attention. Very clever, but no. <laughs> Boxing, I found, was far more scary than, than stand-up was, ever was. There is a crowd, there's smoke, lights, and you step into that ring, and you know, this guy wants to take your head off or whatever, and all of a sudden you're just rethinking every decision why you got to this point. My coach And when you asked uh, earlier, was it kind of uh, ghoulish because of his condition? 
No, he just, I let him talk. He just went into it and started talking about how, you know, it all uh, began, you know, like when he uh, became uh, aware that he was getting sick and then he was kind of given a death sentence, which is so, you know, he was about 36 years old and he was told that, you know, like you're pretty well done and there's nothing they can do about it. So it's very tragic and very sad. And you're a wonderful guy too, though, Vito, for coming to see him. Remember when he was in the hospice at the end? Yeah, that was brutal. And, and there was just a bunch of us that went there. Yeah, but I mean, it was really good that you made the trip. And a lot of the other comics, Kenny and Darren, and, you know, a few of them came down. And uh, that's, I guess, the one kind of interesting thing about the comedy world. You do meet people that, you know, become very good friends during tragedies like that. And I'll just tell you one uh, interesting little story though, was that uh, he kind of helped me so much because he inspired me as to why I made the documentary. Uh, there was a flood at my mother's house in 2006 and all of my videotapes at that time were wiped out, they were gone. So I assumed that that was gone, boom. You know, the, because the interview I did with Dave was in 2005 and it was just the sit down interview. And then so many years passed and blah, blah, blah. I got really depressed and, uh, you know, I just felt that there was no creative spark. You know, that thing where you get into that kind of a dump and you're going, oh, you know, just, I couldn't get inspired to do anything. And then I was cleaning up around here and I pulled out this drawer and at the back, something shuffles and I reach in and oh my God, I pull out this little tape. And on the back of it, it says hook. So I go and I put it in my camera and somehow it's like magical. I'm not making that story up. And there it was, the full interview. And then I thought, I'm going to do a bio on this guy. You know, I can do it. I've got class, uh, clips from Club 54. I've got this wonderful uh, in-depth interview with him. He's such a great subject. He's a very good speaker. And then that inspired me so much. And then I thought, boom, when it was done, I was like so proud of myself but so thankful to him for kind of guiding me through to do something, right. you know what I mean? And it's now inspired me to go, I want to get um, video of all the people I've known in comedy, you know, yourself included and Donnie Coy and hopefully Mark Breslin. And you went down to uh, Los Angeles, right? And you did Was that in my bio? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually was in Los Angeles. I never performed though when I was in Los Angeles. Why not? Uh, I went down and it was just the city and everything. I just At this point, too, I was becoming disheartened with the whole thing. And what they had told me at that point was uh, I could come down and do a spot, a three-minute spot, if I waited all afternoon to be picked out of a crowd of people to go on that night. So there was no guarantee I was going to be able to go on. So at this point, I'd already been a professional comedian for like 10 years. And it just, it's almost like not arrogance or anything. It's just like, why am I doing this? I've been through this. Like, I don't think I want to do that all again. Because I know what we're chasing. You're chasing fame and admiration and everything. And it's like, I don't need that anymore. Okay. I mean, it'd be great. I'd, I'd love to be, get like great money and be in movies and stuff like that. But there's a hard road to hoe to do that. And I'd already sort of hoed it in a place that, you know, didn't matter. If you're, if you're doing it in Canada, there, it's kind of pointless. Like people used to say, well, you can't get famous in Canada. And it's true, you can't. But at the point, you don't know that sort of stuff. You have to sort of find out on your own. And, uh, and they sure left a hole in my heart, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, you don't have friends like that again in, in life. You know, like you're, you're blessed to, to have people that you have that camaraderie. Yeah, you and, never, you never, you never irreplaceable because they were uh you know yeah and they're also part of your youth you know so that kind of part of me dies i mean i wish i could you know call them up again i i think i still have you know their their phone numbers you know the stuff you can't throw away you know and i'll tell you one real touching story uh on the dave uh, hooks um, i was most nervous about sending it to his family of course um because they didn't know this interview even existed and so I first sent it to his brother, Jeff, and I, I, but I had gotten in touch with Jeff. He was the only one because I asked for some pictures 
I, you know, and then, but I thought if I can get his approval, then I know it's okay. But that was the most nerve wracking was to send it because it was about his brother for God's sakes. And, you know, he loved his brother and he did not, he had never seen this interview, which brought him back to life for like 25 minutes, right? And uh, anyway, he gave me a glowing, uh, you know, blessing for having done it. You know, he said, you're a wonderful friend. You kept my brother alive and on and this video, it's a wonderful tribute to him. That was a fantastic compliment to get uh, from him. But uh, the thing that really touched me was I sent it to his girlfriend, his ex-girlfriend, or ex-girlfriend, still his girlfriend, I guess, in a way. Anyway, um, she sent me back. She just said, you know, beautiful, but a hard watch as it would be. And then sends me a picture and she says, do you recognize this? Now this, it was a picture of the hockey jersey that he's wearing in the interview. Mm -hmm. Like she had not thrown that up. She had kept it all these years. And I thought, wow, what a treasure, you know? And what a fitting tribute to a love, right? That you would keep that so many years, just a piece of the clothing. And then ironically, there it is in the interview. It's just life is funny, isn't it? Sometimes it all just kind of ties itself together. I've watched it three times and I think this is this is something that I, I, I think Dave would, would have loved. Oh no, I know he would have. Yeah. I know he would have. And I gotta tell you, just the fact that you liked it enough that you would call me and ask, you know, for this kind of Zoom talk about it. It's amazing, you know? It just shows still the power that Dave's got. That, uh, you know, come on, it was just, it's just basically a documentary on somebody, but yeah, you know, but it obviously was, affected you enough that you wanted to talk about it. So I think that's great. I, I think we, we forget too much about uh, when we see things on TV, we forget that that person is, uh, I notice as, as you get older, you're not as judgmental as, well, you are at certain things, but everybody's got a problem. Everybody, you don't know what, what's going on in someone's life. No matter what I want to say, no person is born a stand-up comedian. Like, when you come up, oh, I could never do that. People constantly are coming up to you and saying, oh, I could never do what you do because of the nerves and everything. But <laughs> I think alcohol did help a lot. And that's not saying that. I'm just saying, trying to point out that that had a bit to do with it but yeah that's what i i got out of it was because if you saw dave maybe three years before that you would say he's got everything going he's got you know and then just to get you know kicked in the like just absolutely that was you know that's devastating i remember it, you know so i'll tell you one other thing though the guy had such balls i mean he even kind of made a joke about it and it's in the documentary where he's doing a spot he's doing the song at uh, club 54 and he's doing um i'm having a bad day that song yeah and you know and he even mentions that he says uh in my head they found a tumor da, 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 I got, they wish they found it sooner like he was actually making jest of what would turn anyone else certainly would turn me into a basket case of self-pity this yeah. guy having that situation goes on stage and does a, a full set and playing the guitar, boom. And then, you know, just kicked ass. I mean, thank God we got that footage as well. And he had that moment of Club 54. So if I helped to keep his uh, memory and his talent alive, that's what he wanted. And, you know, it's the least I could do for my friend. I guess it's true that we say a lot. But the beer is cold here and the bacon's hot. <laughs> and a big red leaf on our flag is all we got. I can live with that. Cause not many people here own a gun. We're supposed to have a lot of beavers, but I've never seen one. Except the one time on the 401, but he was flat. Cause I'm Canadian. Matt that I interviewed uh, earlier had this hilarious uh, story he did about him, and it was just. I was on that show with him. Yeah, just but to show you what a nice guy though Dave was. Dave felt so guilty 
about that. But afterwards, he spoke to the guy that he slammed as a heckler. The guy, the heckler, interrupted his show, and Dave got even with him. And that's the story that you you shared on your last podcast. Um, but right afterwards, boom, Dave went right to the guy. They were talking back and forth, and you know, ended up with patting each other on the shoulders and all that, you know, because he could see the guy was distraught, and that's what started the heckling off. And then I can't tell you how many times when we get drunk and Dave would bring that up, go, oh, why did I say that to that guy? And I said, because you're a comedian. Yeah. You're a comedian and you had to get out of it. You didn't know what the whole situation was. Yeah. And he, but, went, he and you know, it just shows you most nice guys, guy. Just a nice guy. Yeah. One like of these I, talk shows. You like to watch the talk shows there? I was watching, yeah, I, I don't know. I was watching one show. I couldn't believe this. There's a woman on this show. She's a guest, right? She's telling everybody that she was abducted by a UFO. That was her story. She's telling everybody she was abducted by a UFO. And I'm watching this and I'm thinking like, why would you ever admit that to somebody? I mean, once you say that, you're a freak for the rest of your life. Is that not true? If that happened to me, I would not tell a soul. Are you with me? I mean, I could, I could be, I'd have a story. I could be found naked by police in a crop circle and I'd still have a story. You know, I'd be like, hey, I guess me and Black Zambuca don't mix, eh, boys? Yeah. <laughs> UFO. No, no, I was uh, I was having sex with a cow. I mean, <laughs> well, I I want to thank you uh, for your time, man. Again. Oh, I want to thank you too, Vito. I mean, uh, for uh, providing the showcase for Dave Hook, and uh, yeah, yeah, we'll do. We were lucky to know him, and you know, I'm glad that you. You're getting it out there, you know. Stopping Tom, gay stopping Tom, but there's nothing wrong with that. All right. All the girls are out to bingo and the boys are getting stinko and we're thinking about some cornhole on a sodomy Saturday night. <laughs> the weather road is stormy and I'm feeling hot and horny for a gay man over 40 on a sodomy Saturday night. <laughs> well, I'll tie him up with cable and I'll bend him over the table and I'll throw my potato on a sodomy Saturday night. Then I'll slick his ass with butter, then we'll really start the bugger. He'll be screaming for his mother on a sodomy Saturday night. And turns we will be taken when we start the gang raping. And over his mouth we're taping on a sodomy Saturday night. Uh, you'll never see that. Yeah. Anyways, thanks, thanks my friend. So much, and we'll talk again soon. All right, man. I certainly hope so. You take right, care. Folks. And then leave a comment on uh, if you want about, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to show a, a, a little bit of uh, Dave and uh, leave a comment. Something nice. If you don't, you're a piece of dirt. All right. All right. Later. Thanks, Bill. I have a little song here that I wrote. So you ever have like a bad day, like a pretty freaking bad day? So I named this song uh, Bad Day. <laughs> All right. <laughs> My wife told me she's leaving, my wisdom teeth are bleeding, my hairline is receding, and my dog, he ain't breathing. My daughter's skipping classes, my doc says I need glasses, my son likes men's asses, and I haven't paid my taxes. And I got gonorrhea and swollen genitalia, I drank some bad tequila, now I have diarrhea. My hair is turning gray, I don't know what to say, my son just joined ballet, it's been a bad day. It's been a bad day, it's been a bad day. A priest called me a liar, my car blew a tire, my house was set on fire, and my son just joined the choir. In my brain they found a tumor, they wish they'd found it sooner. My sex change is a rumor, I think I'll trick a schooner. I got into a bar fight, when camping got a snake bite. My son is a transvestite and I'm losing my eyesight. I got gas, forgot to pay. I almost got away in jail tonight. I'll stay. It's been a bad day. It's been a bad day.